Hi, welcome to BWB TV. My name is Brian Kane. I'm the co-founder and publisher of Bioprocess International. Today we're being joined by Jonathan Royce. Jonathan is the business leader of chromatography resins at GE Healthcare Life Sciences. Thanks, welcome, Brian. Jonathan. Thanks, it's great to be here. Jonathan, there's a lot of buzz going around about emerging therapies. However, monoclonal antibodies continue to grow and increase in popularity. Can you provide us with some current market trends impacting monoclonal antibodies? Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, monoclonal antibodies have grown from a sort of fledgling part of the industry to now being more than 50% of the biotech market. Um, and there's a huge pipeline of antibodies still to be commercialized. So if you look at so many market reports, they say that they expect the market's going to grow to on the order of around $125 billion by 2020. Um, it's still growing in the double digits. But to your point, there are a lot of emerging therapies. And even within the antibody space, there are a lot of emerging technologies coming. So you see a lot more focus on things like antibody fragments and bispecific antibodies starting to populate that pipeline. And that's going to present um, an in uh, increased amount of diversity even within the antibody space as we move forward into the next five or ten years. But we think that the the market as a whole is, is strong. Um, there's a lot of interest both from manufacturers and from clinicians and uh, there's a lot of room to keep improving technology in that space for future manufacturability. Great, great, thanks. And certainly uh, improving production titers have put a lot of pressure uh, on the downstream purification uh, as we all know. Yeah. Uh, what are the most critical purification challenges currently facing biopharmaceutical companies? Well, I think in the antibody space, um, you know, you mentioned the titers and, and, and that has created a situation where um, downstream purification is challenged. So there's been such an incredible increase in titers over the last uh, basically two decades. We've seen over more than a hundredfold increase in the productivity of cells. Um, and that means that downstream purification technology has to really um, continue to evolve and, and meet those sort of productivity gains so it doesn't become the rate limiting step in processes. Um, I think the other thing that a lot of people are looking at today uh, is around how do they utilize their existing equipment more effectively and also how do they frankly, utilize uh, reusable raw materials more effectively. So if you look at chromatography resin, for instance, there's a lot of focus on how do we get resins cleaner, how do we make sure that they don't get contaminated by a bio burden, um, and really get the value out of those resins that, that end users expect. Interesting. Oh, thanks. The, the role of protein A, in general, what role does it play uh, in purification efficiency? Well, you know, protein A, it's, it's really, um, I always say, it, it really is the holy grail of antibody purification. Many people look for alternatives to protein A, but it's a molecule that developed over millions of years of evolution to protect the bacterial cell against our, our immune systems. It has a fantastic um, specificity for antibodies that's very hard to match with anything that we would uh, engineer as an alternative. And it's really enabled the market to move to a state where an antibody can go from drug discovery uh, essentially into manufacturing in very short periods of time. I mean, there was a lecture earlier today from the team at BMS and they were talking about um, on the range of 12 months uh, of doing late stage process development and getting into manufacturing. And protein A has been a critical um, part of that story, but at the same time, protein A is becoming a rate limiting step in many processes. And that's because of um, exactly what you said in your previous question around upstream titers. So the mass coming onto protein A columns is really increasing um, and that means protein A in many cases is actually determining the, the efficiency of an entire manufacturing facility. How does protein A relate uh, to, to bio burden? So protein A, um, you know, bio burden I think is, a, is an area of focus for a lot of people working in downstream purification today. Even, we've even heard that the regulatory agencies have taken a particular focus asking um, manufacturers do they understand sources of bio burden? What are they doing to control them? Are they testing sufficiently for it? And protein A is really challenged in that, in that area because of two main factors. One is that the protein A step is loaded with all of the cell culture nutrients that your cells were given to grow in. So it, you have a load fraction coming onto the protein A step that is um, highly promotive of bacterial growth. And then you also have that combined with the fact that the majority of protein A resins that people use today are um, somewhat susceptible to damage by 
sodium hydroxide, which is the most common CIP agent that, that folks are using today. So you have, you have the highest risk factor for bioburden outbreak combined with the weakest chemicals to actually control those outbreaks. And that means that protein A today is, is actually, in a risk analysis, protein A would stand out as, as one of the probably most susceptible steps in the downstream purification to a bioburden contamination. Jonathan, GE Healthcare has just introduced MapSelect Prisma. Can you tell us a little bit more about that new chromatography resin? So maps like Prisma has really um, been uh, a, a big effort by GE Healthcare to address two of the main topics that we've discussed. One is around the throughput of downstream purification and trying to make sure that protein A is not the rate limiting step in that process, that the, the protein A columns are uh, have a capacity that's on par with the other steps in the process. So today we have cation exchange resins that have capacities for MABs in the range of 80 to 100 grams per liter. Protein A has historically lagged behind that, and there's really no technical reason for that. Um, so we felt that it's important to try to bring Protein A up into that same sort of level in terms of capacity and productivity. Gotcha. At the same time, MAP Select Prisma is also really designed to enable the sort of CIP operations that you also have in those other steps in the process. So we went back to the drawing board with the ligand. Um, we've had the Shore ligand now in our portfolio for uh, over 10 years, it's been a fantastic part of the story of MAB purification and the platform ability of, of MABs. Um, but we really felt that we could go back and do some additional work based on new technology to find ways to improve its alkaline stability. So today, MAB Select Prisma um, is a new resin that has stability from 0.5 up to 1 molar uh, sodium hydroxide. That means it can be cleaned with the same CIP solutions that customers are using for cation exchangers and HIC resins. Mm. Um, and it also has uh, capacities uh, in the range of 80 grams per liter and upwards um, that really make it well matched also in terms of capacity to the, the secondary and tertiary steps in a process. Jonathan, how can Prisma help biopharmaceutical companies produce more product with their existing platforms? So, so Prisma, um, as I said before, is, is really designed to be essentially ultra high capacity protein A. And what that means is that if you have an existing facility um, where you have columns or systems in place, those columns and systems can now process much larger loads of, of antibody than what they previously could do. Mm -hmm. It means that as upstream titers increase in your bioreactor, that your downstream purification can handle those uh, increased loads without having to make additional capital investments to buy larger systems or buy um, larger columns. It also opens a bigger window of operation for pre-packed columns, mm -hmm. so today, uh, the largest ready-to-process column that we have could actually harvest and purify a, a high titer 2,000 liter bioreactor. That's something we can't do with any of the previous generation of resins uh, in our portfolio. Um, and additionally, as you start to shrink, as you start to increase capacity and thereby shrink the size of columns that you're using in your, in your operations, you also get a lot of secondary effects like smaller buffer tanks um, and less consumption of buffer, which can also be very important in terms of making sure that plant efficiency stays high. Now, I know you just launched Map Select Prisma, mm. but if you can kind of look forward even a little bit farther into the future, yeah. what do you think's next as far as helping companies reduce costs and decrease manufacturing times? So I think, you know, if we go back to your first question about the, the diversification of, of the pipeline that's coming, I think there's a few things. One, I think that in the future there's going to be opportunities for additional affinity resins that are more specific to the molecule types that, uh, that companies are developing. So if you look in the bispecific space today, there are over 40 different constructs of bispecifics, some of which can be purified by protein A, but some of which are going to require other types of affinity solutions. And I think also you have, if you look even farther back in the pipeline, you start to see that there's, there's a lot of new uh, types of therapies coming that are going to require totally new thoughts around both production and purification. So some of those um, therapies, for instance, are too large to be sterile filtered. They're going to require more aseptic processing in the downstream area. Some of them are uh, too large to actually even go into a chromatography resin. That means that there'll be opportunities to work with uh, membrane adsorbers and other technologies that are less uh, diffusion limited than chromatography. So I think we're going to see a continued development in the space around, around uh, new technologies that enable those therapies to come to market and really enable them to be manufactured in an efficient and cost-effective way. 
Exciting times? Yeah, very exciting times. Thanks for having me. Jonathan, thank you for joining Bioprocess International and BWB TV. And thank you for joining this edition of BWB TV with Bioprocess International.